Well, I want to welcome you all to the Living Word Fellowship. I'm coming to you from the top of the North Mountain in the Annapolis Valley, and I just wanted to speak to you for a few minutes from here because what I'm going to be speaking about is mountains in the Bible, both uh, physical but especially the spiritual significance. It's a beautiful view from up here, as you'll see as I pan around. You can see Bridgetown below us and the South Mountain on the other side of the valley, up and down the valley. And at one time, this was a meeting place for the African United Baptist Association. It says here that September 1st, 1854, Granville Mountain, 20 years after the British Empire abolished slavery, 13 years before Confederation, charismatic visionary Richard Preston founded the African Baptist Association at Granville Mountain a milestone in Canadian history. And it has some other significant things in this area. And just down this road, Inglewood Road, is the Inglewood Baptist Church where the uh, local black people meet. So Mountains have quite a significance in the Bible. They're mentioned over 200 times, and even here, you know, people meet on mountains. In Korea, there's a prayer mountain. Moncton has a prayer mountain. So we're gonna be speaking later on about mountains and their spiritual significance. But now, Karen and Tim Henniger are going to lead us in praise and worship. Hello, welcome. I decided to try to stop saying good morning because I figure people could be watching this at various times of the day. So, welcome to our service today. Uh, we are glad you have joined us. and. We are missing our guitarist today, but uh, hopefully next week he'll be back with us. So we're going to lift up the name of the Lord. He is worthy of our praises. And we want to exalt you today, O oh Lord. We lift up your name.
any longer, that we can come and enter in at any time. And your word says that we enter into your courts with thanksgiving, enter into your gates with thanksgiving, and into your courts with praise. Thank you, Lord.
We give you all our ambitions and our hopes and our dreams. Lord, that you would live through us and that we would be a blessing, Father, to you and to others.
Good day, everyone. Originally, I had planned to film everything up on top of uh, the mountain at Valley View Park, but uh, it got a bit chilly up there. The wind was about 50 kilometers an hour, and uh, you know, even though the sun was out, it was still not very warm. But anyways, we're here today, and I just wanted to share some things about mountains uh, that are mentioned in the Bible. Um, you know, we sometimes think of, you know, that comic about the holy man on top of the mountain, everybody goes up to talk to him. Sometimes that holy man is supposed to be God. Um, but, you know, people have gone up on top of mountains for you know, a number of reasons, you know, the biggest to get away from the world. Um, you know, the valley is where 
the majority of people live. And in the valley, um, you know, sometimes with the um, just everyday life, you know, it crowds out uh, our walk with the Lord. So, <clears throat> to continue on, um, you know, many things in the Bible convey a spiritual meaning as well as a literal one. And sometimes it's only the literal meaning that makes sense, and sometimes it's only the spiritual meaning. In most, although perhaps not all cases, mountains and hills represent a higher level of spiritual consciousness or awareness. There are many examples of this, you know, Moses, when he went up the mountain to receive the Ten Commandments. Um, in Psalm 121, it starts with, I will lift up my eyes unto the hills, from whence cometh my help. So, we understand that these, these sim, you know, symbols can be enlightening. So the first one I want to look out, look at, is Mount Ararat. You know, it's mentioned in Genesis eight, and it's the mountain where Noah's Ark landed. And on that mountain, Noah saw the rainbow. You know that God had promised, and Noah and his family came out of the ark and they made an offering and praised God. And God never, God promised never to destroy the earth with a flood of that magnitude again. Now, we don't know exactly where the ark is. You know, sometimes the Bible describes the landing place as Mount Ararat, but in modern day Turkey, where Ararat is, it's a, a chain of mountains. So regardless of where the actual site of the Ark is, the mountains are still there. Um, they're highly regarded by the Armenians. Um, and um, if you want to climb, it's a, a three day journey to get to the top. So what they do is the first day they get to the first camp, second day the second camp, and then the third day they reach the summit and then come back down again. So the spiritual significance of this mountain is that God made a promise. You know, we can, as I said a week before last, that God makes promises and you know, he keeps those promises. So when we look up in the sky and see the rainbow, we know that God will never destroy the earth again with a flood. So I'll just read those verses. It's uh, Genesis 8, chapter, or verses 20 to 22. Then Noah built an ark to the Lord and took of every clean animal and of every clean bird and offered burnt offerings on the altar. And the Lord smelled a soothing aroma. Then the Lord said in his heart, I will never again curse the ground for man's sake. Although the imagination of man's heart is evil from his youth, nor will I again destroy every living thing as I have done. While the earth remains, seed time and harvest, cold and heat, winter and summer, and day and night shall not cease. Noah built an altar and sacrificed the clean animals on it. God promised that he will never destroy the earth again by a flood. And the sign of this promise is the rainbow. Now the second um, mountain is Mount Moriah. 
So in the Old Testament, Abraham was commanded by God to sacrifice his son, his only son, Isaac, in Genesis 22. Now, we know that Isaac wasn't his only son, but it, he was the son of promise. And so they were to go from Beersheba to Mount Moriah, which is about a 50 mile journey. So it would take them three days to do it. And in that three days, they probably didn't talk very much. You know, um, they had a couple servants with them. And when they got to the mountain, or they could just see it off not too far, Abraham told his servants to wait here and he and Isaac would go up and make a sacrifice. So Abraham put the wood for the sacrifice on Isaac's back. And this is all symbolic of what happened to Jesus. You know, Jesus had the cross put on his back. And so Isaac asked Abraham, where's the sacrifice? And Abraham said, God would provide a sacrifice. And God provided a sacrifice in Christ. So they climb the mountain. <clears throat> Isaac builds, or uh, Abraham builds an altar ties Isaac, and Isaac would have been a young man at the time, not, not a child like, you know, some pictures depict. So if he wanted, you know, he could have resisted what Abraham was doing and put the wood on the altar, got everything ready, and had the knife ready to kill his own son, the son of promise. And then an angel appeared and said, no. And just then God provided a sacrifice. A ram was caught by its horns in the thickets and Abraham was able to use that animal as a sacrifice. So, there's a number of things of spiritual significance here. One is that God showed that he would provide a sacrifice. And later on, we see that that sacrifice is his own son, that he did not spare as he spared Isaac. And we are thankful for that that you know Jesus was the sacrifice once and for all you know there's no need for any other sacrifices it's by his blood we are redeemed so the third <clears throat> the third um, mountain is mount sinai now it's located in the Sinai Peninsula. So it's in between Egypt and Israel. And this is the mountain that Moses went up to receive the Ten Commandments. And they're both mentioned in Exodus 20 and in Deuteronomy. And the people of Israel had been delivered out of Egypt, and now they needed structure and assurance. So Moses went up the mountain and talked with God, and God wrote on tablets of stone the Ten Commandments. And, you know, these commandments, which you know, most of us know, and Jesus summarized them whenever the, you know, Pharisees asked, what is the, the greatest commandment? And it's to love the Lord thy God with all thy heart, 
with all thy soul, with all our mind, with all our strength. And second is to love thy neighbor as thyself. And so if you do these two commandments, then you're fulfilling all the other ones. Because if you love your neighbor, you're not going to lie about them. You're not going to steal from them. You're not going to commit adultery with their spouse. All these different things. So the spiritual significance of Mount Sinai is that you know it's a, a place where Moses met God and then returned from the mountain to regular life. And this life that Moses would live would be under the law. And it's, you know, the law was created to show us that our sin could never be atoned for because we'll never be perfect without being born again, without having the blood of Jesus cover our sins. So we're, we're thankful for that. But that's what the law shows us. You know, it's all in Galatians. Now, the fourth one is Mount Pisgah, also known under the name of Mount Nebo. So after spending just about 40 years in the desert, Moses was told by the Lord whenever they asked for water, God told him to speak to the rock. And Moses, by this time, had become really upset with the people of Israel. And he took the rod in his hand and he struck the rock. And because of his disobedience, God told him that he would never set foot in the promised land. So he had to go to the top of Mount Pisgah or Mount Nebo. And he could see across the Jordan River. He could see Jericho. He could see the promised land. And even on a clear day, you can see Jerusalem from Mount Nebo. So, you know, this is what happened because Moses didn't do what God had told him. Now, the spiritual significance is that sometimes it takes a lifetime to accomplish our purpose. You know, Moses, at the age of 40, had killed an Egyptian and then left Egypt, got married, um, basically was a shepherd for the next 40 years till God called him to go back to Egypt to deliver his people. And then the next 40 years spent wandering in the desert and brought them to the point of entering into the promised land. So it's also a reminder that God keeps his promises to his children. You know, God promised that they would enter the, the land and, and they, they did right after Moses died. So the fifth one is Mount Carmel. <clears throat> I've been to Mount Carmel. There's a, a statue of Elijah there, it's supposed to look like Elijah. And it's in the northern part of Israel. And there's a lot of culture, a lot of history. There's, you know, towns in the area that have been inhabited for thousands of years. And the story is told in First Corinthians or First Kings 18 of a great spiritual victory on Mount Carmel. Uh, Elijah uh, confronts the prophets of Baal and says to Israel, 
choose this day who you will serve. And so he has a contest with these prophets and basically says, we'll set up an altar and you put your sacrifice on it. We'll call on our God and you call on your gods to light the sacrifice and whoever God does that, he is God. So uh, the Baal prophets, they, you know, they set up everything perfectly. They put on dry wood. They have a dry sacrifice. They all day long, they call out to God, their gods. And um, they, they get to the point of even cutting themselves and crying out and nothing happens. So then it's Elijah's turn. And Elijah does everything that you would think is wrong. He um, pours water on the sacrifice. He pours water on the, the wood. He fills the, the moat around the altar. Uh, you know, these are things that you don't want to do when you're trying to light a fire. <laughs> and then he calls out to God and God burns up everything, the water, the sacrifice, you know, and then people know that the Lord God is the Lord and it's not Baal. So the significant spiritual significance of this is that our enemy has been defeated. You know, Elijah showed us that we can believe, we can trust in the one true God. You know, Jesus has bought the victory for us. And you know, we're, we're fighting a defeated foe. He, you know, he's been defeated. We're just here to do a mop-up operation. Number six, <clears throat> Mount Hermon. This is also known as the Mount of Transfiguration in the Bible. And we saw this when we were in Israel. Um, it's actually a, a series of three peaks along the border of Israel to Syria and Lebanon. And this event happened in the New Testament. And, you know, visually it represents heaven meeting earth. So Jesus took his three disciples onto the mountain to witness this transfiguration. And Matthew relates it, you know, to something similar to Moses going on Mount Sinai. Moses took with him, at least partway up the mountain, Aaron, Nadab, and Abihu. And Jesus took Peter, James, and John. Moses saw the glory of God and his face shone from speaking with God. And Jesus was transfigured with a glory that wasn't not reflected, but it was his own. And we know from Hebrews, it says that a greater than Moses has come. So Moses was faithful as a servant in all of God's house, but Christ is faithful as a son over God's house. So in Mount Sinai, God spoke from a cloud and God did the same in the Mount of Transfiguration. And because of it, the disciples fell on their face. And so Moses, having been the first great lawgiver, so on the Mount Transfiguration, Moses and Elijah appeared. So Moses was the lawgiver and Elijah 
was the great prophet of God in Israel. So the, the word for transfigured is the word metamorphos, from the Greek root metamorpha, a word which means a change arising from the essential nature of his person, not an external impression. Peter's offer to you know, build three tabernacles, he burst out and said, Lord, this is great. Let us build three tabernacles. So, you know, he was excited about this without really thinking about, you know, what is happening before his eyes. And the Greek is emphatic in the word suddenly, you know, that God pulled the rug out from under him. Like, they... Moses and Elijah appeared and then they disappeared and Jesus was there all by himself. But God said something. He said, this is my beloved son in whom I am well pleased hear him. So the spiritual significance of this is that we will be changed when we spend time with the Lord. You know, Jesus was changed on the Mount of Transfiguration. He got to spend time with Moses and Elijah. And the closest equivalent we could say of that would be spending time in his word. But we can also spend time in communion with the Lord. You know, it's important to spend time praying. And like I said before, praying is a two-way conversation. You know, we talk to the Lord, but we have to be quiet sometimes and listen to him talking to us. So spend time with the Lord. The seventh mountain, the Mount Olivet, or it's more commonly known as the Mount of Olives. And we were there back in 2011, and it's a beautiful garden uh, just outside of Jerusalem. And we know that Jesus went there often because when Judas wanted to betray Jesus, he went there to betray him because he was there often. And so Jesus was there just before the crucifixion. And, you know, this was also where he ascended into heaven after coming back, being raised from the dead, you know, 40 days later. So the significance of this mountain is twofold. It's a place of prayer. So that's spending time separated from the world and being with the Father. And like I said, Jesus was there often. And also, it was the place where Jesus left this world to go to heaven. So it's a place of drawing near to God. Now, like I said, you know, these are just spiritual equivalents. We don't have to go up a mountain to be with God. We can do it in our bedroom. We can do it in a closet. Uh, we can do when we walk, wherever. It's just important to spend time alone with him. Uh, there's a story of uh, Susanna Wesley, John, John Wesley's mother, and she had so many children, there was no way that she could get away from them. So she would actually just pull a blanket over her head 
and spend time with the Lord that way. So in conclusion, you know, there's, there's many other mountains mentioned in the Bible. As I, I said before, um, there's over 200 Bibles, or the word is mentioned over 200 times. They're all different shapes and sizes and different locations. But the purpose is in looking at these to draw us closer to God. A bridge the gap between God and man. And that's really all I want to get across to you is that it's a time to remember, to separate ourselves from the things of this world so that we can spend time with him. It's not that you know, being on the mountain is any better than being in the valley. You know, we always remember Psalm 23, you know, though I walk through the valley of the shadow of death. You know, the, the valley isn't just a valley of the shadow of death. I mean, it, we live in the Annapolis Valley. You know, there's, there's orchards and farmland and all kinds of good things. And you know, God has created those things for us to enjoy. You know, usually mountains, if you go to tall ones, like, you know, Karen and I have been to the Rockies, and there's nothing up there. You know, I mean, it's cold, windy, uh, you know, rocks, snow covered. Um, you can be alone with God, but, you know, it's, it's a, a place of solitude so we we can spend time at both places so I just wanted to leave you with that today and um, don't forget to spend time with the Lord let's pray Lord we come to you this morning to thank thank you for your word uh, <clears throat> for the reminder that um, mountains were created for a purpose that uh, we can spend time on them but the spiritual significance that you have instituted promises and um, a time that we can set aside to be with you I pray this morning a, a blessing on each and every one watching this video that they would receive from you anything that they need. I speak healing and health to those that need it, that you sacrificed your son for a purpose. And that purpose is salvation for our, our spirits, that we can be set free from our sins, but that we can also be set free from any sickness, any healing that we need is in you. And we thank you, Lord, for that in Jesus' name. Amen. God bless.